Let's get close but not so close for a time. You can shade her from a distance for a time. You know we want to see each other. You'll have to stay in your own time space while we talk. Welcome to Quarantine. This is episode 48. We're marching up towards that big 5-0, which will, of course, happen just after the election at precisely the moment that the future comes, whatever that looks like. And, and speaking of the future, you know, so many of the shows that we have done recently have looked at um, how do we build the world that is next? This sense that, you know, there's probably 15 years in which to get things right in terms of climate change, reimagining uh, a capitalism. How our, our, how our cities will work better. Uh, we've had a lot of g- discussions about the digital and the, and the interface to the, to the real world, especially during this quarantine time when we are spending so much more time in our virtual worlds. Today, we want to zoom in on the tools that make that possible, and, and not just kind of theoretically and tools that are being built, but also how they apply uh, to, to very much the real world. And so today's show is one that we're calling Feeling the Future, the Tangible Physics of Mixed Reality. Mickey, why are we calling this the tangible future that we can feel, possibly a gut punch from the future? Um, you know, I, I just, I'm fascinated by um, when we see early signals of new medium or new 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 ways of expressing things. and um, And I think when we talk about Virtual reality, that's kind of like this disconnected reality that's, that's you know, made out of polygons and things like that. But the emerging place of mixed reality, where it actually kind of knows, it mixes real world, but it, 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 it actually knows about the things that are maybe in the real world and the digital world can kind of interact with the real world, is, is something that I feel has a, has a chance to be very visceral. And um, I recently attended a lecture by a group out of um, out of Zurich, and they were exploring the body computer interface. And they were doing this explicitly to help people that actually have fear of heights or um, or other sort of um, challenges. And um, and they did a really interesting experiment. They had somebody wearing a, a, a mixed reality environment they could kind of see around. But they also um, had a button that you could bring yourself out of yourself and you'd see your avatar like maybe two feet, three feet in front of you. And they took a, a long pole with a feather on the end of it and they, they pet your back. And you could see the pole petting the back of the, mm-hmm. of the avatar, but I could feel the pole like on my real back. The person could feel it on their back. So like when it was petting it, um, it was petting the real back of, of the real person. And your body tends to actually expand its sensorium and believe that it's connected to something else. So it started believing that that thing a few feet in front of you was you. And then they would give the person a chance to like walk to the edge of a cliff and and kind of pull the body back out again and look over the edge to get the thrill, but put the body back in and feel like they're okay again from their first person. And they actually said over the course of time, a few of these episodes and, and these experiments, people actually reduce their fear of heights. And so I think there's this visceralness because our sensorium, our body, um, just it, 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 it naturally adopts. A pencil becomes an extension of my fingers. You know, we, we have this way of extending our senses. So I think it's going to be very tangible. Um, and I'm also a, a big fan of a, of a researcher that has been a, a, a sort of a, a guiding light for me in the world of sort of how computers interact with the real world. and what they call tangible bits, uh, Hiroshi Ishii at MIT. And so today I'm super excited because we've got two guests that are gonna talk about both the platform side of it, like what happens when we can do this, and also um, what would happen if we could actually have a better model of the real world in a physical environment and a digital environment as well that would let us explore the future without maybe, maybe necessarily um, putting the real physical places at risk. Um, That's from a bad decisions. time for the big reveal of who's on our show today. Who's on our show? Yeah, we, we have uh, Timothy West, uh, who who is with Unity, 
and is building a number of the mixed reality uh, platforms. Hey, Timony. Hey, welcome. And, and you're uh, on mute. I just want to flag. Um, okay. Timony, okay. thanks for coming. And also sure. with us is Mark Enzer today, who leads the digital twin effort for the United Kingdom. So this is applying these mixed reality technologies, digital technologies to th that duplicate in the digital world what's in the real world and then let you interact with them. Hey, Mark. And you're on mute too. Hey, Mark. Hi. Mark, Thanks, by the way, Steve. is coming to us from the United Kingdom. What time is it there? Oh, it's, it's crazy o'clock. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's Halloween here, by the way, which explains why Mickey and I are in ridiculous outfits for people who are time shifting from the future. So I'm excited for today because we are, uh, Timothy, we're going to get into tools that are used both for gaming and for enterprise purposes, but really push us into a new language, right? A new way of experiencing things. And then Mark, you're going to be showing us how the United Kingdom is applying these as really a part of its civic infrastructure, which is a vast and fascinating idea that we will get to cover today. We'll yeah, it should see, be fun. We will see in a bit. Tim, Timony, why don't we start with uh, with you? Um, you? You know, the, the show we did, the, our last show was with uh, Andrew McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan's grandson. We talked mm -hmm. about media as the extensions of, of man. And you've written a lot that when we come into this world of mixed reality, which I hope you'll explain to us in a moment, that that this is this is a new form of language or media. That is to say, we might think differently, frame the world differently, act differently because it is so engaging and involving um, to a degree that is different or is fundamental to change is when we went from the spoken word to the printing press. Um, give us a sense for what mixed reality is and then why this thing is so different than perhaps on the surface what we see in a computer game. Wait, sure. even to me as a start, who are you? Just yeah, so now quick. tell us who you are. <laughs> Just a little, a little background, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so I, I'm Timony West. I'm, I'm the Vice President of Augmented and Virtual Reality at Unity. Uh, my team does two two things. First, we we because Unity is the the de facto tool for creating all sorts of three D experiences, particularly interactive ones. We we extend out Unity as much as we need to in order to allow our our creators to be able to make the experiences that they imagine in their heads. And then secondly, we try to use these new mediums as much as we possibly can to enable an either an even wider class of creators to be able to make really cool, interactive, immersive worlds and experiences, uh, which is no small feat as it turns out. So um, I want to touch a little bit about sort of language as technology, which, you know, uh, McLuhan mentioned, you know, the, the medium is the message. What the way you choose to frame a message fundamentally alters the meaning of that message was, you know, the, the thrust of what he was saying. And uh, I'd given a talk earlier this year that we referenced um, in which I, I quoted Ted Chiang, who in, uh, in one of his short stories made the point that um, language itself is a technology and any given technology changes how we, how we think about things. We don't tend to think of language as a technology because we grow up with it, right? But the fact is it's not necessarily native. We have to go to school, we have to be taught it. Even today we have dictionaries to help us remember how to express things in a way that others, others can understand. That is what makes it a technology. It, it allows for a speed of transfer of thought more quickly than we can do in any other way. With these new technologies, uh, I mean, it's true of computers across the board and the telephone before that and the telegram before that, you know, it's turtles all the way down. But one particularly interesting aspect of augmented and virtual reality specifically and mixed reality in the middle there <clears throat> is that I think we as humans have been thinking about this for so long, we already feel like we, we get it. We understand how it works. We we see it in movies. We read about it in books, all the way back to the holodeck in in Star Trek, and you know the Jetsons before that. I think we've always, even from dreams or imaginings or paintings, been very able to uh, not only envision ourselves in another world. And this might be ex an extension of, of the proprioception example that that Mark mentioned before this call, but. Um, we, we're able to put ourselves in other places very easily. It's part of human imagination. It's how we're able to to uh, predict events and, and empathize. The unfortunate component of <laughs> augmented mixed and virtual reality is that what we imagine it to be like and what it truly is like 
are not the same right now. And the, and the, the reason is there's always a computer in the middle. I often use an example in my talks where you see, you know, like in movies, someone who's a wizard who has like telekinesis will kind of like look at something and go like this and it comes towards them. You know, they're basically using a combination of gestural, what you would say nowadays, gestural language and, you know, like head gaze or eye detection to do something. And then, you know, the object comes towards them and it goes the other direction or, or explodes, whatever it is that the person wanted it to do. It's easy to imagine this. Uh, the problem is that in order to do this in virtual reality today, you have to tell the computer what it was you wanted to do. Okay, so you're going like this. Did you want to explode it? Did you want to move it? Did you want to move it towards you? <laughs> These are the things that we don't articulate, right? In movies, it's like kind of assumed that, that somehow it just kind of infers intent. So, so I think that's one big hump we have with these mediums is they feel like they should be extremely easy to use by default. They feel like they should be natural because they get so very close to what we know of the real world and what we imagined that magical next step to be. But the reality is, no, there's still just a computer and you have to tell the computer, no, no, I meant to just copy and paste that. I didn't mean to explode it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, and in, in insofar as we've learned a lot of new languages, uh, there's a kind of a whole host of new types of literacy that we have even over the last century for most humans. Not only have, you know, since the 1920s, uh, most humans in the world finally be literate in, in the written word. Now we have a literacy around sounds, um, electronic alarms, buzzes, fire alarms. None of these noises existed on sort of a mass awareness until the, the, the technology existed again in the 20th century on. And now in the 21st, we, we've gone used to the dings and beeps of our phones. Was that a Facebook message? Is that an Android phone? Was that a phone call or was that a text message or was that an alarm? Right, right now, if my phone went off and the alarm went off, you'd probably recognize that ringtone. And that itself, again, is a kind of a form of literacy. Uh, so many, actually, before you go too much further on this, I'm really interested, um, just for for anyone watching, I want to I want to get a really clear distinction mm -hmm. um, between uh, VR, virtual reality, and MR, or you know the the I think Magic Leap maybe brings it as MR, mixed reality, or or the new generation of sort of augmented reality. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Like how would I how would I know what what which one I'm looking at? Okay, mm -hmm. experiencing. There's two main parts here to all of this, all these types of realities. Um, the first is what the display can do, and the second is how many sensors it has. So let's start with virtual reality because that's pretty consistent, and I think that more more consumer VR at, um, headsets been sold than any other kind. Uh, so with VR, you have two displays that are connected to your eyes, usually through some sort of scuba-looking uh, uh, head-worn contraption, and uh, those displays are, show you a stereoscopic rendering of a fully digital world. Sometimes you could have a pass-through camera so you could see the real world as well, but even that's still digital. You're just seeing a display, right? At the end of the day, you're looking at a, a two, two tiny little computer monitors. And then on the other side of that helmet, the part that you can't see, usually there is some amount of um, infrared light that is used to track your location. Um, well, now it depends on the system. It could either use external cameras facing outwards to track this to your location, or it can use some other system infrared or, or something else. But the re at the end of the day, the point is that as you move your head up and down, side to side, and you move around in space, your your the location of that HMD is tracked, and this is how it, you can feel like you're moving around the world, and the the world moves with you with your head, so you don't get sick. And, and so other, in that world, and I remember back in the 90s, they would be they would be doing this just with gyroscopes attached to the back of the head, you know, and they yeah. would just sort of know what was happening. Um, in that world, the thing you're looking at, though, is just the two monitors, really. And yep. you're looking at some kind of total digital representation. It's That's something right. That's that, right. It's a fully, you know, it's fully completely digital. virtual. OK, yeah, exactly. And so now <laughs> take us to. Or is there more to that? And then take us yeah, to no, the no, no. mixed well, reality. I mentioned yeah. the controllers are tracked as well. So usually. Uh, so yeah, hands. if you do have controllers that are not that are beyond your, you know, your uh, holding onto a mouse or a joystick right. from the mm -hmm. old days, then somehow it's tracking those two. So it kind of knows you're holding this high or low or something like that. And that's what but, allows you to play like a first person shooter, or pick up an object, yeah. Manipulate, okay. Yep, so, and then, uh, and then I'm gonna go at the other end, uh, augmented reality. Um, well, 
I think to mixed reality are kind of basically the same thing. So these days, it seems, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of kind of weird, almost kind of reverse, which is funny. Okay, I would think for this discussion, a distinction point here, and let me just—I may be naive, but in when I think of a virtual reality, I think of this very rich world, but it's simulated. It's not the real world. It doesn't interact with the physics of the real world. It is its own thing. When mm -hmm. I think of augmented reality, I think of I'm looking at the real world, and there's a layer that's feeding me information on it. I'm looking at it, it's more stuff. It's like I can click on it, but I'm I'm not bringing it into and acting on its physics. So one is looking at the world and showing me stuff about it. The other is completely distinct world. And it would seem that what we're headed towards is the richness of virtual reality and some feedback or ability to go between uh, what we imagine and the real world. Is, is that kind of the direction, the distinction or how the, what's emerging here? I think so. I, I mean, that's kind of the classic Milgram distinction. I think it's all blurring together maybe a little bit more. And let me explain why. Um, when you have something like a Magic Leap, do you have your Magic Leap? You I do. I have, I, have a, I have a show and tell. So this is a Magic Leap, um, which I, the developer kit is pretty amazing and insane. Yeah, um, this can actually, I guess, see your eyes moving within certain degrees of arcs. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has little cameras looking out, as you described. Yep. But but you see sort of through the display. Yep. Um, uh, but w what I found interesting was, you know, Google Glass was kind of lambasted a lot when it came out because it was basically applying the WIMP paradigm, Windows icon mouse pointer paradigm, yep. as like just a sheet of glass. And then we had all the bad parts of the Google web and all the rest shoved in front of our face. And and of course it got, you know, to about 500 degrees on your, on your temple. So it wasn't so great in that regard. But yeah. Um, but this thing was really fascinating. I gave it to my friend's 16 year old daughter and she immediately just started setting things up in this living room. And she was just like picking things up, playing around. She, oh, that dinosaur just climbed around the house. And, and it, it knew where the real thing was. And that's what I was intrigued by was, you know, theoretically, if there's a glass tabletop here and I have a virtual ball and I set it on the table, I could see a, a reflection in the glass tabletop that's the real glass, yep. but my, my brain would see that. And that's where I get, I was like, whoa, this is, this is different. And yeah. people haven't really had a chance to taste it yet or experience that, it. That, I mean, that is a result of billions of billions of dollars worth of technology, because what, what that device, which I think has 14 to 16 cameras, can't remember exact number now, uh, does is literally has to scan the entire world, get camera images of it, extract out any depth information it can extract out any sort of other types of information so it knows how high is that table where exactly is that table and every frame updates the information about it so that way when you place a digital ball on the table it stays in roughly the same space no matter how quickly or you move your head or what you do yeah. next so there's a lot of predictive uh stuff there but also just a lot of processing so it's not just you know just to be able to scan a room and have some sense of fidelity of, of the of the mesh information you get from it, the actual you know depth information could take up an entire um, an entire processor right that's yeah. that, that alone could do it but then on the flip side then it has to update the digital information too so yeah, really fast yeah the Hollands and the magic leap is not to be understated when people say oh billions of dollars you know it's like well yep that's how much it takes to keep computers that small that fast yeah. without burning off your face right well and i remember i spoke with roni uh the founder i don't think he's he's there anymore but i spoke with him not that long ago and he said that you know, his last company was a medical device company that implanted things and that had to do with th with your body. And so he was really interested in not just slapping small cell phones on your face, mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the classic things you see. But part of that money went to actually building biocompatible lenses that actually kind of play with your, yeah. with the way your eyes see. Yeah. And, and I, yes. what freaked me out, I think, was when something went and climbed behind my couch and disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was like, okay, wait, I see steam coming up over there. What's happening? Yeah, you know, yeah. and I had to go climb around it, the real couch. So I, I, I don't think, I mean, the minute I really experienced it, I, I was like, okay, yeah, that I, I can understand that this is going to be a new language. Yeah. Or th this affords a new yeah. collection. Yeah. It's yeah. funny. Um, one time one of our developers was working on a magic leap, but he literally got like part of the UI stuck behind the monitor and couldn't reach out to get it back. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, computers are silly. We need to teach them. Um, the key things, yeah. So most of the time when people talk about augmented reality, they're talking more about the Google Glass and where it doesn't interact with the world. But I would argue yeah. that mm -hmm. um, 
actually augmented reality is more that kind of weird quasi in between state that did not exist when Milgram made his diagram, which is kind of like cell phone uh, augmented reality. Now, the difference between what you can do uh, on a HoloLens or magically versus a cell phone is pretty significant, if only because those are super souped up devices with a bunch of cameras and a whole tracking system. But the fact is when I'm looking at a mobile phone or I take a picture that's a selfie with like a fun, funny bunny ears or something, um, yes, I am augmenting reality, but it's still a, a digital frame at the end of the day, I'm still looking at a display. There is no, it's a pass through kind of, but at the end, you know, like I've got my iPad right here, I'm literally looking at like, a display, a right? Piece of glass. Yeah. There, yeah, and 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 I can go no further. Here it ends. I'm only just seeing what the computer is seeing, and then I'm looking at the computer. I'm not looking at the real world at all. So I'd almost qualify that as a different type, or perhaps that is the true definition of augmented reality versus truly mixed reality, which involves you looking at a real object with your own eyes, uh, as well as the digital objects that are rendered by the device. So hmm. that's my take there. So what it, tell me a little bit about um, when we when we did a little bit of a pre-call, you were talking about Mars. And I want I'd, I'd love you to explain what the heck that is, because I think it goes to your second mission, which is enable a lot more creators to create and start to think in this space. But I could be wrong. So what is oh. Mars? <laughs> I hope you're not wrong. Uh, so yeah, so Mars is a, a, a mixed and augmented reality tool set, although it also encompasses VR. So we're going to have to figure out how to stick that in the acronym at some point. <laughs> but um, Right now, the reason why anyone would use Unity or any game engine to make augmented or virtual reality is because it's a really good world maker, right? This is how you're able to make these cool 3D games. You can make a world that's designed to do it by default. It gives you physics systems. It gives you animation systems. It allows you to kind of reinvent a world of your own devising. And that makes it really good when you want to make um, truly immersive worlds for virtual reality or simulate some of the real world, right? Like you need maybe real world gravity for your AR app. Uh, the only problem is, though, is at the end of the day, Unity is just a digital. It, it, there is no, uh, there is no, or previously was no way for Unity to pretend to be anything other than just a digital world. This, this sounds a little esoteric, so bear with me. So, when I'm making an app for AR. I might be making an app for a very specific location, like I might be making one for um, an amusement park or for a specific uh, conference space, in which case I would best, the best place to actually lay out that app and see it run would be in that space. But you can't always be there. You can't always go there. You don't have access to that space. Or sometimes I'm making an app that is designed to run anywhere, but I want it to look as good as it possibly can, but I don't know what the space will be like at all. It could be running in someone's living room. And even if it just ran in anyone's living room, I have no idea where they put their sofa, where they put a table, do they even have a table? Do they have two easy chairs? I don't know, right? Basically the real world is extremely unpredictable. And even if I had a high fidelity scan of a space and knew every single thing about it, if someone could walk in the door and bump a chair, right? And then again, I still don't know where everything is in the space. So what we wanted to do was a couple of things. First, we wanted Unity to be able to pretend to be the real world. So you can pretend to run your app just in Unity without even having to leave your chair. Right now, the way you make a, an, uh, an app is you, you make it in Unity, you put the build on a device, you run it, you see what went wrong with it, you go back, you fix it, you put it on the device, you run it again. So we added a new simulation view so that you can just basically skip bypass that whole process and actually pretend to be walking around the real space or if you have a recording a space or a scan of a space, you can use those instead. And it really just make your app in the world as if it was the real world. Um, the second thing is that you know, as I mentioned, the kind of the best case scenario is that you're where you want your app to be. So if we've cr created companion apps that allow you to um, actually be on your phone or be on your headset and actually be in the space, laying it out, save it back up, and then and then add, add all the rest, the functionality, any scripting that you need to do directly in the editor, using the best tool for the best uh, the best part of the pipeline, right? When I'm laying out stuff, I want to be in the space. If I need to write a bunch of code, I prefer to be, you know, at a computer with a keyboard, which is still the best way to input code right now. Uh, and then finally, we have to account for the, those vagarities of the real world and every changing unpredictable events. And then we've created a flexible layout system, kind of akin to how the web allows you to have resizable web pages um, or procedural uh, authoring allows you to kind of create 
create new new uh, layouts based on rules. So it, we allow you to put a bunch of flexible parameters together. Like if the floor is this big, create like a map that's this big. And if the floor is only this big, if you only have this much room, then only show a subsection or put it on top of a table instead or, you know, whatever it is that you need to to make sure that your users get the best experience they can, no matter how large or small their living room is, which direction they're facing or their sofa is facing and who else is in the room. So that's the tool set that we have. Um, and the goal really is to kind of use the best of XR for authoring and then also make sure that Unity is as prepared to take in real world data as we can. Get so when you say take in real world data, um, you know, I'm imagining that, of course, you get the, you, you know, whatever's in the room itself. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, but I also think about and, and I used to work, you know, on, on the very large scale software packages, you know, that like Autodesk tools and stuff when you're laying out like an airport or when you're laying out like big things. And sometimes, yeah. you know, you'd actually want to go on site. Uh, a friend of mine was was uh, the lead tech architect on the Mexico City Airport, which is like the biggest enclosed space in the world at this point, although it got completely sort of put on the shelf with the with the election of the new president. But they were going out to this very large space where they actually had to think about the curvature of the earth even. And wow. they were setting up like Vive things with, with things and then trying to locate stuff because they were trying to see how their procedural uh, like yeah. rooftop would intersect with, you know, their pillars and the other things. Are you, I guess, are, are you able to pull in data from structured light scanners or from uh, from you know survey tools or from other or, or other kinds of sensing packs does the platform allow you to pull in mm -hmm. yep. from that okay yeah, and exactly. then are you oh go ahead elaborate yeah so we have a couple solutions um, I mean if by default you know anything that's sort of a mesh with geometry we, we can handle pretty well for very large scale models like BIM models that have a ton of information we actually have a separate tool called reflect that allows you to pull in parts of that and actually work on it in real time so yeah it depends on you know at the end of the day there might be some conversions um, you can always do custom pipelines to make it to make it work yeah. Um, but but yeah we try to be as flexible with taking any any type of data and then updating on the fly like ideally you're getting mm. the real of real time data and this gets into the digital twins conversation and are able mm. to update your information as quickly as possible particularly when it comes to augmented reality you know if you're let's say trying to test out this is a very simple one this this happens all the time like if you're making a face mask and you just want to do something like on smile or when you blink or you open your mouth, you know, you probably want to do that over and over again to test. So either having a live feed of your face that you can test against or having a recorded uh, feed, you know, to just try it out again and again is what you want. That's a very simple use case. That's so easy. It's at hand, right? Like everyone has a face they can smile. <laughs> they can yeah. you know, do it. I'll, I think this is exciting though in that I'm hoping that we get a much more exuberant explosion. And it's, you know, the artists now are slowly starting to get access to this stuff. I think with Mars, it'll expand that a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but an explosion of just new ways of thinking about how we might interact, Absolutely. you know, that might actually fit how humans work more than trying to force us into this like really low bandwidth thing called a mouse and move it yeah. around on the screen or something. Um, Peter, you look like you had a question. Then I want to get Mark on and, and have him yeah. uh, share a little bit about the digital twin stuff that Timony just mentioned. Yeah, I would love, Timony, I'd love you to kind of play out a little bit uh, because we're talking about new capacity, new language, as, as you know, kind of in the McLuhan S sense. This means that the way, the set of things we can do and then the breakthrough uses or the killer app uses are mm -hmm. non obvious and will emerge. And so I'd love your thoughts on kind of the range of what this makes possible. Because, because you know, we're seeing a lot in the entertainment side, but there's a lot here on the enterprise side as we start hooking different parts of the real world into this. But then Mickey and you are also suggesting that there's something in the very human or empathy side or kind of the way that humans can more rapidly understand something. So paint for us kind of the horizon of what of what we might see. Yeah. So, so one sort of unique quality, I think I'll start with, I think they have slightly different uses. So let me start with virtual reality and I can go and go to the, the mixed reality use cases. Um, and it's also different depending on what you're trying to do. So in, in one of my talks, I sort of went through how people have always tried to push the medium a little bit further than it could possibly be pushed. You know, Joyce wrote Finnegan's Wake and no one could understand it, but he's really trying to push forward what was possible with language. Did he succeed? Maybe not, but at least open the doors, right? And then we had, you know, the rise of animation 
and and there were things that people could express through animation you could never have done with a still image right like just simply could not have and now we have like truly incredible movies like um oh what was the christopher nolan one where they're in dreams and like bends the universe you know what i'm talking about where the world I do. it's one of my favorite movies and of course i can't remember it now but yeah where the whole thing wraps around inception right uh and and could, you could try to describe that to someone. You could even do a still image of it, but actually showing how that would happen uh, is not something that that you could do really with any other medium. And I think the same is true, especially of virtual reality. Things like large numbers, which are very hard for humans to grok, even mm -hmm. with static images, um, are best expressed or large areas. Um, things about how, how things will move or have a trajectory over time, uh, groupings of any type that have a, the fourth dimension of time are best ex seen and evaluated in a three-dimensional space. So, and to be clear, because there's 2D, 3D, right? So I can watch a three-dimensional rendering of something on a 2D screen, but it is, it is easier for me to parse if I'm in virtual reality because then I can use uh, head direction and triangulation to actually see the true trajectory of something. Otherwise it always just gets a little bit of flattened out. Um, being able to express uh, really sort of any over arc over time. I've noticed that things like brainstorms or whiteboarding are actually much, much nicer in virtual reality if I need to define a three-dimensional volume, right? Because then people can see it on the fly. And then the cool thing about uh, brainstorming on a whiteboard in general is that when people see you do it, that adds a kind of um, it's almost kind of an animation in and of itself that tells the story as you're making out the drawing. So you can just extend that onto the fourth dimension when you go into virtual reality. Uh, the art that people are able to create has, I think, truly phenomenal and sort of an under undervalued piece of it because it's less monetizable. So those are sort of, that's kind of on the communication side. And then on the um, industrial side, you know, we always say that virtual reality is best for things that are extraordinarily expensive, impossible, can only be done once, like impossible to replicate, or very dangerous, which is why NASA has been using virtual reality for years and really pushed it forward. So any sort of industrial use case can usually be one of those three things. <laughs> so, mm. so having that safety net of being able to replicate it with as much fidelity as possible over and over again, so you can get it right the first time in the field has, you know, significant value. And this is anything from training people on expensive equipment, uh, been, people have to go into perilous situations or on uh, surprising ones, dangerous situations, or or even just being mm. able to model out what something should look like before you move into the production phase. Kind of reminds me of, I went down to Orlando a long time back and, and, uh, and learned about sort of the rise of Evans and Sutherland and kind of the the military applications, you know, where they would do large scale battle simulations um, with censored up, you know, tanks and everything else. And mm -hmm. it was, it goes right back to your point. It's either really dangerous or it's really, ex it would be really expensive to do it um, for real. And so they, they would just do it in the cockpit and then it would all be, you know, virtual. Um, I'd love to bring in um, Mark to talk a little bit more about how how the this stuff happens and is starting to be applied and where he's going. Hey, Mark, thanks for joining Hi. us. Um, I didn't know if you, first of all, if you had any thoughts or questions or reflections on what Timony was just talking about. I didn't know if you wanted to reflect on that. Yeah, um, I mean, other, yeah go ahead. I mean, it's, it's just fascinating stuff, isn't it? And, and trying to see the kind of the connection between what uh, Timony was saying and, and the world I live in. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's this thing of um, seeing both models and reality uh, in mm. physical worlds, digital worlds, and uh, and mental worlds, uh, mm. and and the kind of the the connection between those, um, and I, I think that I, I think the connections are very strong. Um, I guess what what we're looking at with digital twins and the national digital twin is really a connection between physical and digital worlds, uh, and and what Timony has has been articulating brilliantly is you know, some of the connections that you then get into the mental worlds. Mm. Uh, so. So, you know, I'd love to Mark, explore that further. You lead the United Kingdom's digital twin strategy. So I'd love to, for you to explain why that's seen as a critical piece of infrastructure and why that, when you conceive of it, at the intersection, you consider human flourishing and systems. Uh, th that's, a, that's a fascinating kind of remit. So kind of paint us a picture for where this fits in the UK strategy and why systems and human flourishing is at the core. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to like to do that. One one thing which I think I probably should do though yeah. um, is um, 
uh, speak for myself rather than for the UK because okay. that, that feels like too heavy a, a mantle that's, to carry. That's pretty heavy duty. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so, Mark, so maybe if, first a little bit about who you are. Who are you? Uh, yeah. So, so a little bit on I'm, that first. So, so yeah, I'm I'm Mark Enzer. I'm the uh, CTO at Mark McDonald, and um, uh, and that's a consultancy that does all sorts of fun stuff um, in the uh, the physical world, uh, working particularly with infrastructure, so energy, transport, water, international development, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm I'm also the head of the National Digital Twin Program uh, in the UK, uh, and I guess it's it's with that regard um, that Peter's asking the question. Um, as I said, though, far better if I just speak for myself, because maybe then I, it, I can say some us, weird stuff. Yeah. If tell that's, us, that's okay. us, maybe you could tell us just why the UK has this and why that why the UK put this in place. And then your thoughts in terms of why it's important and what you're up to. Yeah. So, so the reason we've got it is uh, actually because um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and, and I'm going to use some some old fashioned language here, uh, and I am conscious that everyone else has come kind of with, with Halloween type stuff, and you look great, uh, and and I've come as an Englishman, and I think that's probably <laughs> that's scary enough. Um, so yeah, we have things like the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So that that's our, our kind of chief finance minister, and he. Um, uh, he set a task for our National Infrastructure Commission. Uh, he wanted to know what were going to be the key technologies uh, affecting construction in the in the coming years. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting that when the commission came back with their report, uh, they entitled it Data for the Public Good. Uh, so it wasn't actually about technology at all, and it, it wasn't really about construction either. Um, so they kind of disobeyed the uh, the instruction, but come back with something much better. Uh, and so it was recognizing the importance of uh, of information fundamentally um, and, and seeing how information gets served by technology rather than the other way around. Uh, and uh, also, crucially, this thing about it being focused on, on public good. Uh, so in that report, it recommended that we should move towards having a national digital twin and we should establish an information management framework to enable it. And we should bring people together from across government and academia and industry to align and pull together to, to deliver it. So, so that's really where it's come from. It's this, this whole notion of using data for public good. Um, and one of the first things that we did when we set up the program um, was establish something that we called the Gemini principles, uh, which sounds sounds pretty cool to me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, about setting out the values that we think should guide us on this journey, developing a national digital twin. Uh, and we, we think it has to be values driven. Uh, and those values are built around purpose and trust and function. So um, yeah, the values are kind of at the core of it and public good. So say a little bit more about the um, Gemini, you know, it gives, gives me that picture a little bit of what you just referred to before, the, the intersection of reality and the model of reality and data for the public good. Um, and you, then you said, you know, values, purpose, trust. What were some of the other values or what were some of the other core principles in this, in this uh, imagining? And we also have the, um, we can put up the website for the National Digital Twin Program as well. Amit, if you wanna pull that up as well and, and share with our audience. Yeah, yeah. So should I share a little bit about what we see as being digital twins and national digital twin? And, yeah. I, and I think it's then in that context that the values make sense. Is, is that yeah. worth doing? Yep, perfect. So, so I guess if we're looking at a digital twin first, and and, and this really picks up on uh, some of the stuff that uh, Timoney was saying, and I and I think it would be great for us to have a have a conversation about. Um, but it's a connection between the physical world and the digital world. Um, and so I guess at its simplest, a digital twin can be seen as a realistic digital representation of something physical, actually assets and processes and systems in the physical world. Um, but what really makes it a twin uh, is a dynamic data connection between the model and the thing that is being modeled. So it's making this connection, an absolutely crucial connection by data, connecting the physical thing um, with the digital thing. Um, and that unlocks all sorts of, uh, of potential value. Uh, we think that the key bit of value and, and the kind of the point at which the value gets unlocked is actually about decisions and making better decisions faster and cheaper. So it's taking that data, doing something clever with it, generating insight, using that insight uh, to enable better decisions. And then those better decisions drive 
better interventions back in the in the physical world. So it's making this kind of two way connection between digital and physical. Uh, and th that's what a digital twin is about. Um, and that's that's great. You know, we can see digital twins being used all over the place uh, in infrastructure um, at various different levels, whether that's at an asset level or across a whole system or, in fact, across many systems. Um, and where the national digital twin comes in is that we don't see that being one massive model of everything, but rather we see it as being an ecosystem of connected twins. So we're imagining many different twins for many different purposes um, and then uh, the connections between them being shared data. So if we can crack that thing of secure, resilient data sharing across organizational and sector boundaries, then we can start um, building this ecosystem of connected digital twins. And that, that becomes really super exciting because it, it can start to model the complex um, ecosystem, the physical ecosystem of infrastructure, which we recognize as being a, a system of systems and it needs competent tools to be able to manage it. Um, so, uh, uh, Mark, I want to stop you there for a second. Um, two two things. Um, one, I want to actually, um, w when you were saying better decisions, and I thought that was really wonderful because like that's the core here. And I remember the other day when you were elaborating on this, it was sort of how do we make better decisions? How do we make better decisions on the right time scales? Because these things operate on different time scale. You know, you might your your company might work on the the London Underground. Well, what's the time scale on that? There's the construction time scale, but then there's the lifelong time scale of that or Heathrow Airport, big pieces of infrastructure. How do I make better decisions? Then it seemed like it was how do I help during construction or during the building phase? You know, what's the decision to make at the right time for like a pumping station? And then it's sort of like over the life cycle of the thing, are we using our money well as a as a as a country? Are we figuring that stuff out? And then you know, and then it's sort of how do, how does this actually affect the public good? Our, uh, you know, how do we how do we think differently about infrastructure over time? How do we play that out? Can can you talk us a, a little bit more through that kind of that kind of uh, yeah yeah sure system of systems of systems? I, mean, I, th I think I think you've you've touched on it really well there. I mean, I think that um, if you're looking at individual assets, you can imagine uh, decisions being made around those which are kind of optimizing operation. Um, uh, kind of optimizing energy use or chemical usage or, or whatever it happens to be around individual assets. Um, and I think you're right. If, you, if you're kind of optimizing operation, you kind of need to work on a pretty short time scale. The data refresh rate is going to be, be pretty rapid. Um, and then you can imagine, uh, as you did, um, uh, at a larger scale, looking at, at planning decisions across a whole system. Um, and running mm. what-if scenarios, uh, that then maybe the data refresh rate doesn't have to be uh, qu uh, quite a such a frequency. Um, so yes, you're right that there time does come into it for sure. Um, I think there's other things uh, that come into the the decision making. Uh, and again, without going too esoteric on it, I think that um, um, what we can fundamentally see is that that information, you know, is that stuff that destroys uncertainty. That's kind of um, my summary of what what Shannon said, um, and so if if we've got something that can destroy uncertainty, we want to use it well, um, and uh, you know that that's what we're getting when we're taking this this data. We're doing something clever with it. We're generating insight. You know that is destroying uncertainty, which enables us to make better decisions. However, that there's always going to be some uncertainty left, uh, and there's a time balance to be to be made because if you want to make um, the right decision. Do you wait a little bit longer to get a bit more information in order to make a better decision, uh, or is it something you actually need to make now? Uh, and, and so there's a there's a kind of a decision about the decision uh, of of choosing when to make it uh, with how much information and how much uncertainty. Uh, and so I think that you know the whole thing about making decisions better um, is a is a kind of a science in itself. Uh, but for sure, if we can serve decision makers up with better insight, then they're in a better place to make better decisions. Um, well, I want to stop you there for a second, because I always try to I always try to kind of capture um, some of the people we've we've name dropped through the show in case people are more interested in also pulling on that thread. So you just mentioned Claude Shannon. There's a great new uh, documentary out called The Bit Player about Claude Shannon. So so for those listening, he invented the theory of information. He also rode around on a unicycle, and he was considered a proto-Burning Man uh, person, but back in the 40s. 
So also created wireless things to go hack Las Vegas. Um, so he was really interested in what information was. And it, it, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, Timothy, I think you mentioned Ted Cheng. Was that the science fiction author that wrote Arrival or was that somebody else? Same person. Ah, okay, so <laughs> just to, to connect it um, mm -hmm. in, in one of the people you quoted. Um, Timothy, I didn't know if you had any any questions or thoughts, just reactions to what Mark is starting to explain about, about yeah. the program. So, I mean, of course, my perspective is usually about like, more like very much about the implementation. So as you were, you were talking, as two things came to mind. You're, you're kind of limited by what sensor information you have available to you, right, about the actual object. It could be, you know, a camera on the device. It could be a camera facing the device. It could be any sort of, could be anything from water pressure to tank level to, you know, depends on what the device is. But um, I guess so first, do you have ways of standardizing this or ways of expressing this across devices that so that you can kind of, you know, either make it easier to plug and play or be able to sort of compare information. And then second, do you have a similar framework for for decision makers to be able to kind of make decisions across what at the end of the day is probably a very large and varied set of data? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're putting your finger on, on key, key points there. Um, and I think that the availability of data from sensors uh, and the variety of sensors um, and the way in which we can get uh, that that data uh, into the machine uh, is uh, advancing incredibly rapidly. Uh, mm -hmm. And I guess the, the, the whole kind of IoT space is, is helping with that, yeah. no, no doubt. Um, and so I guess one of the things we do see is that the, the unit cost of sensors is dropping through the floor. Yeah, you know, so, so so we can imagine getting a lot more data from a lot more places, um, but uh, I think you're you're pointing at the standardization of that. It's not just can you get the data, but is it going to come in any meaningful format that you can do something with? So yeah. so you're you're absolutely right. Of course, we have to address those kind of standards. Um, I think actually we have to address that across the whole life cycle of of um, or get the whole information flow through um, digital twins. So it's not just from sensors into the digital twin. It's also um, <clears throat> um, from all sorts of other data sets, because you can imagine the data won't just be coming from sensors in the, in the real world. It'll also be coming from, uh, from kind of weather data and it will be coming from um, existing uh, ground information. You know, it's, it's gonna be coming from every kind of angle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess that you know, part of what we see is, is important um, is, uh, enabling a common language of data so that digital twins can talk to each other. And I think this is a little bit of an echo of what, what was talked about, you know, quite a few minutes back, um, um, you know, about language and, and how we how we move forward and how we learn and how we um, relate message to medium, etc. Um, so in the sharing of data between digital twins, which I said is at the essence of the national digital twin. It's an ecosystem of connected twins. What connects them is shared data. You know, that language of shared data between digital twins has to be shared, it has to be common. Because what, what obviously wouldn't work is you've got kind of islands of, of twins which only speak to themselves. They can't speak to the twins on another island. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is probably the key challenge that we have is coming up with a language um, of data sharing between twins, so that twins can talk to each other, and and it, and I think that's one of the best analogies that we've got. It, it's enabling a, a new language. So standards because for that, but then also, and, th and this maybe touches on your world, Timony, is is that <clears throat> we need humans to be able to interact with the digital twins. You know, it, it's no good just having the connection between the physical world and the digital world. We've also got the connection into the mental world, mm -hmm. and and so. Humans need a kind of a porthole, a window into the digital twin. Yep. And, you, and that's that's where um, AR, VR, MR, any other kind of R you think about, um, that's that's where it matters because because humans have to interact with it, if nothing yep. else, to know what's going on. But hopefully humans will still be in the loop. You know, humans will be part of the digital twin loop, making decisions before the interventions. Um, what what is a bit scary is having completely closed loop digital twins which have got no human interaction at all. So yeah. so all through that that loop, we're seeing that standardization uh, is is a a real need. 
Hmm. And Mark, the great promise of this is, and the reason we're excited about digital twins more than just the digital model of a building is the possibility of integration, de understanding it as a system. You give it examples of if you want to understand a flood coming, you need the topography, you need the weathering patterns, you need changes. And if all this comes together, new insights are possible. And this comes precisely at a time when we realize the world has to be more resilient. And resilient means kind of the ability to deal with uncertainty by integrating a whole lot of things that are going on and making decisions. So this is that systems thinking is key part of it. And to pick I, up on something, go ahead. Oh yeah, sorry, I was just, just gonna agree with you as strongly as I possibly can on, on the, that systems point, because I think some of the, the grandest challenges that we face just now, yeah. you know, whether that is to do with net zero or all the resilience thing, uh, yeah. or, or even um, circular economy, you know, some, something yeah. that you really need to get our heads around, all of those are systemic challenges and there's no way that we can solve them in silos. So, so it's an absolute necessity for us to, to have this systems thinking in order to solve those challenges. And right, and in fact, it's a system of systems, right? If you were trying to solve a problem for a city, you have to deal with pandemic, circular economy, the economy in general, and climate, right? All of well, those things. Are I've, I've got to comment in here. So, you know, I, I have another hat that I wear that's the a senior advisor at BCG. And I was just getting a, a briefing today from their global uh, team. So the team that actually helps with um, uh, understanding the ebb and flow of trade relations, the ebb and flow of things. And the EU apparently is very soon going to be putting in a carbon tax uh, or a carbon thing where basically if you import anything like a car into the EU, it needs to have actually factored in the carbon, uh, the carbon usage in all the parts of the car or else the car can't come through the border. And, um, and this is going to be a significant thing that's coming not, not very far away. Um, and, and it made me think about today, we're all like, don't bring carbon into my country. Don't bring carbon into my thing because of the, the climate. And yet, um, it's a, 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 somebody that we're going to have on a future episode is working with NASA on a permanent embankment, a permanent placement on Mars. And he was saying he's got nothing to work with. He has no raw materials. He has like dirt and whatever. There were no dinosaurs that they've been able to find yet that could give us petroleum. He doesn't have plastic. He has to actually kind of bootstrap himself up for all the things aside from basically uh, regolith mm -hmm. and, and possibly water and a few basic things. And so I wonder at some point if we were able to play out a D, you know, UK digital twin, if we were to play out the ebb and flow, many of these things are non-linear, right? They look, mm -hmm. they look bad before they become good. And, and, you know, that's the value of simulation is, you know, the polio vaccine started actually going the wrong direction and people were calling for it to be stopped until suddenly it went the right way and we were able to get close to eradicating polio. I wonder at some point, will we actually be like, no, please, dear God, give us your carbon because it's, it's, it's feedstock. We're not going to, we're not going to throw anything away anymore because we actually want the raw feedstock. So we that, want that to be able be, to build new things. That might be the case. Um, you know, it, it, it's imaginable, but I, I think that, um, that, you know, that going back to the Peter's point about this being a system of systems, that, um, you know, it, it's like one of those balloon dogs that you get at parties. Maybe you don't over there, but, you know, you squeeze one bit of it and it goes down there, but it comes up somewhere else it, Yeah, it's, be because it's a system. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think the, the thing is um, that uh, it's only when we see the system that we can imagine a cyber physical system. Yeah. yeah, which is basically what I was describing with the um, mm. uh, uh, earlier on, um, but but going going back to this idea that you can't solve systemic problems in silos, the way you break silos is by sharing information across them. You okay. know that that's how a silo can be broken. In which case, let's bring on um, digital twins that can talk to each other. And then the human Emily, do, did you have another question? It like different, you having people different stakeholders Sorry. be able to look at that simulation and and then have people either agree or work together. Timony, you made a point earlier that when we were talking about the advantages of mixed reality, you said this is really useful when you're dealing with periods of time, over time, so time series, when you're dealing with large data because you can visualize it, and I think also complexity. So you're almost exactly setting up the required interface things to deal with complex, large information over time. They come Which is together in ways that you may not predict or have expected. And actually this mm. whole conversation has reminded me of one of my favorite quotes from As We May Think, which was, uh, and I will just quote it here, I'm not that great at quotes, 
A record, if it is to be useful to science, must be continuously extended, it must be stored, and above all, it must be consulted. And I think mm. one real advantage to digital twins and being having, rather than having data sort of discreetly recorded in its own place, like this is what carbon gets you, having it as part of a larger simulation of a, of a complex system is how it gets consulted in a way that is natural, in a way that humans would, would intuitively grasp. But you wouldn't have to think, wait a minute, but what about the carbon? Let's let's run the sim with the carbon or without the carbon, right? That that puts too much pressure on the human to remember to make that connection themselves. And that is actually kind of one of the fundamental quests that all of the early um, computer makers wanted. They didn't want the computer just to compute the answer to a question that you had clearly articulated and thought up yourself. They wanted the computer to help you make that connection that you otherwise wouldn't get. So I think digital twins are truly beginning to cre create enough of a world uh, data store in an interconnected way that we we can depend on computers to make help us make that connection. Hmm. Mark, I love the I, idea. There, there's a there's a concept of sort of you know a lot of times when you do Google search, you have to know what you're searching for. Hmm. You have to be able to say, yeah, I want puppies or cats. Um, but uh, you know, I've seen some really beautiful work in generative design and in uh, in the generative space that's kind of like a Google search for things that don't exist. It's sort of like you say, here are the goals, here are the constraints, and then it, it sort of does a peapod experiment like Mendel, and it mm -hmm. generates all sorts of weird things that like no human would ever do because many of those things are dumb and <laughs> nonsensical and don't fit a mental model. But every once in a while, they have this really wild thing. And, and it felt to me when I first started playing with generative systems uh, like Dynamo and, 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 and Refinery and things like that, that it like, it, it was like a Google search for things I didn't I didn't even know I was looking for because it would like come back with something that was that was a provocation more than anything. I'm I'm curious about between Mark and Timothy, if you guys had, you know, a secret skunk labs, you know, skunk work labs between Unity and you know Mott McDonald or or Cambridge and the and the UK digital twin thing, what would be the pilot? What would be the th first thing you'd want to prototype or or play with that would actually get you closer to to aspirations, you know, uh, Mark, your aspiration of sort of data for the public good and really helping people with better decision making. What would be an interesting, fun pilot or, or prototype? I just like to ask this question of all our guests because I never know what the mashup is. So either one yeah. of you. So um, I, I think one of the, <laughs> um, the, the most important ones for us to do um, is something that we're calling a, a horizontal thin slice, which means nothing. But <laughs> um, what, it, what it does mean is a, um, um, a thin slice through the National Digital Twin. We're not building the whole thing, but just an example. But it, mm. it's a, a whole slice that joins up different sectors. Uh, and, and we don't really care which sectors they are. Uh, I think um, a sector which would be really interesting to join to anything else is energy because it, it is connected into everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and one imagines that could be energy and transport, but it could be energy and water. Uh, and to show um, the... Um, the connection between uh, digital twins in those spaces. So mm -hmm. you can imagine digital twins for transport, digital twins for energy. And then if you've got electric vehicles, you say, okay, what are they? Are they transport? Are they energy? Well, the truth is they're both. Uh, and so you know, mm. where, where those digital twins meet, the energy digital twin and the transport digital twin, that's, that's what I would like to, to, um, mm. to have in this, um, this pilot, this demonstrator that you're allowing me. But actually, I would I would love uh, for Timoney to be uh, in the team. Actually, if I may, because this is this is we're imagining it, yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think um, if we could get uh, that level of uh, interaction between the human and the digital twin, people would buy it. You mm -hmm. know, if if um, digital twins look like they're boring things that engineers do, um, then it, it's you know what's that? Whereas if we really get the um, the visualization working so that humans can interact with the twins, you know, then they will fly. Uh, and so it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, to, to, have, to have a joint team that did this? Well, I like that idea because it would also collapse. You know, one of the, I, run a, I run a weird other live stream with Dr. Ting Jiang from uh, Dan Ariely's lab around behavioral economics and how humans, like uh, w what we find is that um, current Mickey doesn't really like future Mickey. And so current Mickey will commit future Mickey to all sorts of crazy things. And then when future Mickey gets to become current, I'm like, what did I commit myself to? That's crazy. 
And it's partly because we have very bad, um, my dog is barking. The, 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 the center that actually Dan Ariely runs is called the Center for Advanced Hindsight. And it's because hindsight's 2020, but we don't have, we're sort of myopic about the future. And I would love something that was a thin slice that actually helps reduce reduce decision myopia. That's actually, and, that was uh, yeah. I take it. Yeah. I mean, I'm a member, card carrying member of Long Now and have been now for many years, which is, I think, intended to solve the same problem, right? Hmm. Not think short term and continue to make bad decisions for future Mickey, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that would be, I think, my next step. But then it makes perfect sense, especially as a proof of concept. And then what I would love to do is stack a bunch of years of data on top of that mm. and then run sims on top of that, right? Like what? predicting, <clears throat> looking at the last 50 years of data, last 100 years, or maybe even just focusing on the weird years of the, the aberrations, what then could we best use to predict about future information across those across those data sets? Could I ask the two of you, and, and, and Mark, you might start with, you know, in, in, the, in, in the UK, who, who is the client or the um, stakeholder for this? So I could imagine why this would work for policy policymakers or, or technocrats, but this is also a government and this is also where you want to persuade people. So I would imagine it would be wonderful if this kind of decision-making tool showed up in what students might think of as a gaming environment where they're actually looking at and trying to trade off the long-term issues of their society. And I would also imagine mm. that as you're building out this form of governance, we want to take care to make sure that it's inclusive and people don't feel like it's the typical thing where there might be one community meeting and a decision is made. In other words, th this is a powerful tool, as Timothy points out, a language to understand things. Um, who are the stakeholders? How widely can it be used? And what are possible instantiations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the stakeholders really are, are the, the people of the UK. Uh, mm. And it kind of goes back to uh, what we were talking about right, right at the top around um, the Gemini principles, flourishing systems, the whole idea um, of focusing on people and outcomes for people. So, so, so the, the idea, I think, of the whole of infrastructure, actually, as a system of systems, uh, is to serve people. You know, we, we live in this amazing machine that we have built. Um, its purpose is to make our lives better. Um, and I think we should call it out and, and kind of do it on purpose. It's, it's all about outcomes for people in society. Do we serve people because a policymaker is trading this off and making a decision that, uh, you know, for example, as Mickey points out, uh, there's a carbon tax? Or do we serve people because lots and lots of students get to use this and the way they learn about the world is by actually, you know, for example, under playing the trade-offs in their country, which could be seen as an act of citizenry, right? There's an act of inclusiveness that could be here, but that's a little bit different than serving the people through representatives or technocrats. So, Yeah, I mean, maybe, I mean, I don't want to sound too much like a Boy Scout here, but um, I, you know, I, think, I think the reason why we, we want to serve people is, is because it's the right thing to do. You know, that that's kind of why we're here, isn't it? And, and you know, I, that that's that's what I think is driving this, and and the whole idea mm -hmm. of of data for public good. Yeah. Um, but but I I think that it's something that kind of needs to be uh, fought for. You know, certainly mm -hmm. for, on a mm -hmm. philosophical basis, yeah. uh, because it it's not a natural conclusion that data will be used for the public good. Yeah, you know, we see a lot of other models. Mm -hmm. We're running a natural models. experiment in America on that very topic as we speak. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you didn't so, say. Yeah. Well, that actually um, reminds me of, of something I read recently, which is that, um, at least in America, and I'm assuming this is true in most countries for obvious reasons, uh, if you if the, the the party or allegiance you you subscribe to is not currently in power, you tend to believe the the government what the government says less. Mm -hmm. and actually, that that has a pretty strong implication uh, for for any sort of attempt to have if not a nationalized, at least a, a countrywide set of data that, that can be used if yeah. a large percentage of the population does not believe that data is accurate or true. Hey, real quick, I just noticed uh, Jean Pablo Villamel, who is an amazing uh, artist and technologist who helped do the city lights that, that's, that go across the Bay Bridge and worked on a number of other things, um, put in a question that says, could that, could that fit with something like this? And I want to just say I have no idea what you mean. So, so maybe John Pablo, um, elaborate on what this is because we've talked about a bunch of stuff. And then, meanwhile, uh, uh, in the in the comments, 
And then meanwhile, um, Mark, you, you wanted to get to something, I think. And I, I just want to give you the chance to, to explore. Um, uh, I think you said, could we talk about taking over digital worlds? I'm not sure if that was what you meant, but tell yeah, me what yeah. you mean. So, so it's a kind of a, a follow on from what we're just touching there that, that I say, you know, it's not a given that we will use data for the public good. I, I think mm. that's the right thing to do, um, mm. but it's not a given that, you know, there are other models um, which which don't seem so attractive. Um, mm. And I think that, you know, effectively what we're doing here um, is exploring whole new worlds that, that haven't been open to humans before. Mm. You know, and, and generally what happens when humans find a new world um, is, is that kind of strong men take it by force it, mm. and, and then and then they fight over it. Uh, mm. and, and what I'm just wondering is whether we are seeing the kind of the beginning of a takeover of the digital worlds, you know, mm. this whole new space, which is new to us. We, you know, it, it is a new frontier. So who's going to take it over? Uh, and I think wow. we should do that with our eyes open. Um, and it should be people uh, with values and principles uh, so your who, point who take is, it it's, over. A kind, it's a kind of rare resource real estate. It may feel infinite, but it's probably not. Or it's got some other boundary. If it's not about infinite number of pixels or bits or bytes or servers or something, it's some other dimension. Neil Stevenson explores what happens when you never die uh, in his new book, Fall, um, which is about sort of quantum computers that keep keep your, your soul alive forever. And it becomes a real estate play. Your point in the, this whole thing is that the real estate, historically, strong men or coloni colonists have come and basically done land grabs. And what is the land grab for the digital twin or the virtual, you know, the, the system of systems? And how do we make sure that it's actually for the public good? Is that it is it is I that, but, but it's, it's not it's not just the land grab. So so yes, the land grab is the imagery that I'm using. Yeah. Um, but I think it's more about what laws get set up once you've done the land grab. Yeah, and I, and I guess uh, I guess okay. what what you see is that you know when there is a new world that that people can explore, that that generally historically it has been the strong men or the rich men or the the men with the the, the most guns. And notice that I am saying men here. I mean, it's very rarely women. And you know, uh, shouldn't there be some more women involved? Um, but but the but the point is that you know, once they've grabbed that, they set up what laws they they have, and sometimes it's the law of the gun or the law of the jungle. And uh, even okay. the news this week that you know if Elon Musk is going to get to Mars, he's not going to obey any international laws. It's going to be the ones he wants to set up. You know that that's an example of it. But yeah. I'm just although just I've seen to, a lot of James Bond uh, late James Bond films, and he's kind of like a James Bond villain. I know exactly. he has a white Persian cat somewhere. But Timothy, sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a cool cat, I'm going to say, Elon Musk. But uh, well, at least he's very inspiring, let's put it that way. So I have a very practical example of what you're talking about, a territorial mm -hmm. land grab that has significant implications on an individual rights level. Um, mm -hmm. I just had this conversation earlier this week. As we all know, Facebook um, you know, is one of the largest properties on the internet and also has a one person, one account rule. Behind every account, there must be a person. This sounds like a benign rule that is for the betterment of all. However, uh, I believe it was last week, someone was telling me uh, one of the um, very popular uh, anime Twitch streamers tried to make a Facebook account claiming that they were a real person, even if they were not a live person, and therefore would should should be able to have a Facebook account and had other other fans come on board and run them and sort of vouch for this sort of the the realness of, of this persona as, as its own person. Now you may think this is just a persona, right? Behind that that's the person, right? This person the the, the persona does not deserve an avatar or not. However, this this does get into the question of how much are we allowed to 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 define ourselves. For example, you know, gender is the classic example of this. You know, I I, I really chafe every time I, I sign up for something and ask if I'm male or female. Like, usually it's not applicable in any case, but there there should be more options than that. I also should be able to say none. Uh, I think if you sign up for Facebook, it probably would give you many or more options because they understand now that it is simply not 
part of what we consider basic human rights to have to define yourself in a specific way. Does this extend, and this is a real digital twins question in the sort of ultimate sense for, for humans, does this extend to our online personas? Now, when I look on Twitter, and I've been following people for years, I know there are people that I've met in real life who behave extremely differently in real life than they do online. They have a different persona. Mm -hmm. It's an identifiable person, identifiable person, and even if it has, you know, they they even use their their own photo or their real name. Often they don't. Um, but the reality is, the way we behave online, what we can find about ourselves online, is is a different aspect of ourselves that might may or may not be worthy of its own Facebook account. But mm -hmm. Facebook has laid down the law that the, your digital persona online in this in this new digital territory, to your point, Mark, has to have that law. And it is stifling and therefore it has taken away some digital individual rights. You know, you just reminded me of, and I think we name checked this a little while back, but um, Walt Whitman in his um, song, Myself, uh, writing said, um, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that this play acting or even having a different persona, the code switching you do between how you interact with your parents versus your child versus, you know, office versus whatever is actually part of humans. Yep. That's that's like actually how we how we try out what we want to be next. You know, people who say I am a voter have actually made it a part of themselves. You can actually hear it. They personified it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you play. I mean, we've talked about Burning Man in the past, and that is a a place where some people who don't get a chance to put on a different costume. I'm wearing a costume. Um, get a chance to put on a different persona. I'm, I'm interested, um, John uh, Pablo just got back to us um, and his point was, you know, could we have a game that allows people to simulate different policy outcomes? And that reminded me of the idea of folding at home, which actually just did a massive uh, competition with public data about the COVID virus. And they've been able to use, you know, millions of people's computers to actually find COVID uh, vaccine resistant strains and other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so the interesting question would be, how could you take that thin slice of public data for UK citizens and make it the beginning of a kind of folding at home adventure in Mars on Unity, you know, where people are all trying to game better ways of balancing these hard decisions between water and energy and, and something, or, you know, who knows? that I actually, to, to again, I was thinking we could make this available and anyone could try it out. And whoever didn't feel like they were currently being served by the government would not, would straight up be like, be like I don't believe the results of this simulation. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, I, mean, I, I think, um, I think he raises a really good point. I mean, uh, and I think that we're only scratching the surface of the use cases. We're kind of going with the, the obvious ones. Um, yeah. you know, which yeah. I already said yeah. is, you know, things like op optimizing energy usage in assets. And, you know, it's, it's really important, <laughs> but it's not it's not as exciting as I think the possibilities will allow. Mm. Uh, and, and what I think is is uh, fantastic about about you know, what we're on the edge of here is I, I think we're creating a whole new category, a whole new market of mm. digital twins and connected digital twins and the possibilities that that opens up. Mm. Uh, and, and actually, the, the heart of our approach in the in the UK, you know, what we're, we're trying to do is, is this thing where you say um, it, it's collaborate on, on the rules and compete on the game. So we're, oh. we're trying to bring people together to collaborate on those kind of ontological rules which are needed, that we need to share, we need to have in common in order to have this common language uh, for digital twins to talk to each other. You know, you, there needs to be some collaboration on that because if everyone insists on speaking their own language, then everyone's speaking a different language. So, so we, to the core of a really interesting situation in the world hmm. today, which is this notion of are we entitled to our own facts? Because for this to work, you have to have a, a set of facts about what the structure is and, and, and how it's behaved or kind of what the weather has been. And then what we're really saying is if there's a set of input we can agree to, we could disagree about the assumptions or how we think things might behave the outcome, but then we end up with a kind of a, a discussion about different outcomes and, and different facts. So it's interesting to look at the breadth of what this makes possible. A moment ago, we were talking about identity. So there's a whole end of digital twinning where one gets to define it, right? You get to define your many personas. Marcus, strikes me the work you're doing is less that, you know, the 
if we're defining a bridge, the bridge has a certain tensile strength and a certain type of material. So we don't get to play with that identity because it, it we're supposed to agree on that. But once it's in there, um, and I think this gets to this game component, you're building this for policymakers or emergency personnel or telecom people who are trying to game out what to go build. But, you know, essentially people, Mott McDonald type customers, people who get up and their paychecks in infrastructure are government. And yet, Timony, you sit here with a powerful set of tools whose customers are as much enterprise people as middle schoolers at home playing a game with as much physics as Mott McDonald, but they're calling it a game. And what's tantalizing to me is bringing these things together because if the UK is going to create a digital version of itself, the idea of its citizenry being able to play it, to game it out, to think through the climate stuff, to compete on, oh, I factor in more externalities and I get to collect them and I use game mechanics and I level up. There's something about that that in By the way, there's a precedence for this with the UK. Uh, the Guardian, a few years ago, published all of the um, receipts submitted by all the people in parliament. And they were all the receipts for their expenses. You know, did they spend their expense like at a hotel for a public good thing or not? And they actually, the, the Guardian put a competition together on their digital site. So it was actually um, on the Guardian page, it said, compete to find um, mistakes in the accounting. And people basically competed to find, oh, wow, that's weird. And there was a checklist of, did you make a mistake, uh, an honest mistake? And they would like check it. You just doubled like two lines of your expense report. Did you build yourself a pool at public expense? That's like mistake type number two. And over the course of like six months, they saved the UK citizens something on the order of like $50 million in one year's worth of, of receipts or something crazy, like or 50 million pounds, 50, that yeah. That's interesting too, because I, I worked at both Flickr and Foursquare, and and there is a class of user akin to the the Wikipedia editor that I'm sure yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. It's one to two percent of any given user base that are freaking fanatical about organizing data. So at yeah. Foursquare, that the data was clean as a whistle and and highly internationalized on a like per country basis, and it was literally just like no more than six thousand extremely motivated people who just know love nothing more than life and to like remove commas that weren't needed or update you know, just information. So yeah, I wonder, I would love to be able to, to just harness the power of those who, who like kind of the world's librarians, whether or not they know it. The um, world's librarians. Yeah. And Guillaume saying over here that uh, covering mm -hmm. rules and competing on the game is one way to get people to accept the sim. I, I certainly think that another way is to allow people access to change the information if they want to, which has been the great strength of Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that and accessibility. Mark, I've always wondered why Wikipedia, and, and I know we've, we've talked to the Wikimedia Foundation a number of times, and, and they said, you know, the, the classic statement of Wikimedia Foundation is it works in practice, but not in theory. And um, and I kind of love that, but I've always wondered why the the platform, the platform approach, has not been kind of opened up as an API to be used for things like digital twin or for for other kinds of things. Um, just the, the the notion of always you know always keeping a record of all the changes. The notion of uh, they actually have some really interesting tricks to actually allow for. Um, extremists to kind of push themselves out or actually move towards the center in terms of like uh, trying to make sure that they're, they're nailing down facts. And there are a whole bunch of subtle policy rules that have evolved over time. And they're not perfect. 80% of Wikipedia pages are by white men. Um, so it's not, it's not perfect. Uh, but, uh, you know, it probably reflects more of the history books than the actual, than the actual things. But it, 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 one, it makes me wonder. Um, Sometimes I Mark, think like, my friend Ben has been working on open sourcing a lot of CMSs across cities. I think we talked about in our call. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, my first answer, honestly, is that a lot of that data is pro either proprietary or the companies who own it are hoping to monetize it on it in some fashion. Yeah. Well, I wonder too, this, this to notion. The, oh, sorry, Peter, go. I just have a question. Who gets access to the digital twin data in the UK? Because I imagine some is like infrastructure secure stuff that you don't want terrorists to get hold of but you would like citizens to have at it so that, or even game developers to have at it to, to go try novel new uses. So how, how do you think through who gets access to how much? 
Yeah, it's it's key, isn't it? Uh, and so this is one of the things which we've got to got to sort out. Um, we we we're kind of building um, security mindedness in from the ground up. And actually, in those uh, principles I talked about before, the, the Gemini principles, um, in that center um, center group of principles based around trust, we we reckon that um, uh, there needs to be um, security and openness and quality. Uh, and so that that sounds like there's a um, a potential tension there. Um, where on the security one, we're saying that the, the the twin must be secure and it must enable security. And at the same time, we're saying it must be as open as possible. Yeah. And so you know, built into the the value, there's a tension that needs to be constantly reevaluated, uh, which we think needs to be evaluated through conversation, um, a, quite a broad conversation as to where we want that balance point. And that balance point might change with time. You know, things happen that that mean that we that we might change the change where society thinks the balance should be. But it's important to have both. Um, and I, I guess as as we go through, there's there's mm. clearly going to be protocols um, to enable access to the right people to the right stuff. Um, but uh, we might change our mind as to who is the right, who are the right kind of people to get access to what kind of right stuff. Um, and so I think that um, it, that's a, a really good example why this needs to be values driven. You can't mm. just decide it once up front set it in concrete and say it's going to stay like that forever because it's not going to stay like that it's going to change and in fact that's another one of the principles um it's it's uh, um, hidden down there at the bottom in function is 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 that this this thing that we're imagining needs to evolve um and it needs yeah. to evolve uh, as things change whether that's technology or society um so uh, I, th I think some of the stuff that you're talking about peter you know, it is a brilliant question by the way but um it, it's one of these imponderables which isn't a simple answer. And and even if I came up with a simple answer, it would change with time. I, I, as you were speaking, I was thinking of um, so many people or so many companies or even people within those companies might want to monetize in different aspects of the data and therefore keep it private. But it got me thinking about something as simple as a phone number. Phone numbers are at a very strange point in history. Historically, I could look up the phone number of anyone in my region because I would have access to that phone number. Now, I don't know any of your phone numbers unless you give it to me, nor do I have any way to look it up. Like, for some reason, we just decided phone numbers needed to be private once the information went global. I don't think that was necessarily a bad decision, but it is so. If a company did choose to try to make phone numbers available again for a fee, as they did with the phone books back in the day, then that would be sort of a conscious decision on the part of everyone to agree that phone numbers need to be publicly available again. And then is there or a The norm changed, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, well, both the financial value of having a phone number and printing out a big book of them, you know, mm -hmm. and your address, by the way, both, yeah. you know, and, and whether or not that information mm -hmm. should be public or private has shifted, like, not even in my lifetime, I would say, like, within the last 15 years, right? Mm, yeah. I mean, maybe you can still get a phone book, but I haven't seen one in at least. Well, I'm, I'm interested, too, in, you, you know, you mentioned, yeah, the, the phone book. I think I still have some around here. Um, they're great doorstops. You can actually make really fun dioramas out of them if you have an exacto blade. A little bit um, <laughs> but um, but I but I think norms are an interesting thing to think about too, because norms encoded into the digital twin feel, in some ways, important. In other words, um, I'm reading a book right now called "The Weirdest People in the World," and it's actually it just means Western educated. Uh, from the industrial countries, whatever, but it's it's why so much of our behavioral science is wrong because we tested on basically Western educated undergrads for most of behavioral science. And so we have a, a, reproducibility, pro a reproducibility problem in science for this. But I'm reading the book and, um, and they make the point that like choosing not to marry your cousin shifted a set of norms that happened to take over a whole bunch of earlier tribes that totally felt like that was okay. And, and it covers a whole bunch of norms. And in when you're looking at trying to help people be happy or have wellness or actually have a feeling of well-being, uh, happy is not always a fun thing that, to be uh, in the long run. Uh, actually, the feeling of well-being comes through struggle as well. But the cognitive scientists are looking at ways that you actually shift norm. And there have been large-scale things. League of Legends did a, a huge amount of A-B testing 
um, around norms around trolling because they were trying to figure out, do they kick the people off completely if they say really horrible language? Do they actually put them in restricted chat for a while? Do they do other things? And there, there's some really interesting experiments out there where games are able to actually shape norms because we're often shaped by the crowd of people that do something. And so like during the pandemic, a whole bunch of people jumped onto a, a platform and the norms changed because they could see a lot of other people doing it, whether it was like watching you know, the digital graduation or whatever for, for high schoolers or college kids or something, we all saw it. And I wonder how you actually play in a simulation with players and agents or something around norms to actually allow people to do norm design or norm experimentation to actually see what would lead to something that maybe would make a larger population actually happy, but actually go through productive struggle in good ways and you know close equity gaps and things like that. Um, I don't know where to go with that. Um, we're coming up on 525 um, Pacific time and probably 125 or 225 in the morning. I don't know if leap, if, oh, wow. uh, if fall back or forward has happened, Mark. Um, any last kind of words or thoughts from either uh, Timini or Mark? Any any things you're just excited about moving forward? Uh, Timini, I have one question real quick for you, and then any any last things. Um, if I wanted to download Mars and play with it, is it available now? And how geeky do I need to be? Because I'm not really geeky. Uh, it's at unity.com slash Mars. So very, okay. very. Yeah, um, I can your, figure that out. Your level of geekiness needs to be about like if you would be comfortable maybe installing a WordPress site or if you'd be comfortable downloading, um, I'm trying to think of like like Figma or you know, uh, if, you're, if you get into Photoshop a bit. So you can always go in and explore. There's a lot of tutorials and templates mm -hmm. that as well. Um, I'm a master at Photoshop. I could figure it out. I, I do think, yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's, if you can, if you can do basically scriptable things or, or pair of programming, maybe you can get started on it. Get as programming free as possible, at least for all the AR stuff. So, but if you oh, want wow. to make method world, I would, but you know, like I would say, as long as you're not afraid to get your hands a little dirty, you can get to good really quickly. Now that I do think it's wait one question. one comment that just popped into my head. I'm sorry, I can I can't let Mark go either. And Timony, I, I apologize. But you know, you mentioned um, Facebook, and I actually thought you were going to go in a slightly different direction. Huh. Um, and like about a, a week or two ago, um, people were noticing that since Facebook bought Oculus, Oculus was a fairly major platform for developing mixed reality and things like that that they actually require you to have a Facebook account to actually keep all your data or to use your games that you bought for, for, for Oculus. Um, and, and a lot of people, game developers particularly, and people that I know that, that, that you know, were at Magic Leap and now at other places like in uh, Niantic or whatever, um, they're all like, are you kidding me? Like, cause I mean, just watching what Zuckerberg is doing to the country is gives I mean, you pause, you know, <laughs> but that's a, that's a land grab by a very, Strong man. It wasn't uh, in some ways. Well, throw out through, and that we probably bought, you know, a thousand dollars at least worth of games on the Unity Oculus account. Yeah. Oh, did you? <laughs> uh, yeah. I was someone who owns it and make sure they never leave Unity. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, I was going to ask the follow up question. Grab. Mickey asked you the technical question about how to use it. I almost have the sales and marketing question for whom Mars is for. Is Mars for, um, do you imagine your customers will be game developers or AEC developers as uh, as as Mott is, uh, or do you imagine that any corporate developer that has you know been writing uh, applications in Windows will now move towards this? The I'm trying to get a sense for who the customer base is or how you look at this in terms of verticals or apps. Mars is best suited for anyone who wants to make an interactive application. Doesn't even have to have rendering, doesn't have to be 3D necessarily, but that needs to work against and well with real world information. Anything from a wake word, um, voice commands, uh, physical eye input, sensor information, GPS information, anything that's a real world data set that you need to have and deeply integrated into your application, Mars is good for hmm. that. Hmm. I like it very broad. Mark, any last thoughts or just things you you want us to think about next? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it, it's a a bit of um, a reflection on on the themes we've talked about, actually, because because I think that there's so much to be excited about here. You know, the, the possibilities are just amazing uh, um, for 
delivering genuine better outcomes for people and society you know this is this is me doing the boy scout thing again you know the the opportunities to do that are just amazing um but um i go back to the thing that it, it, it's not a given that that will happen and i, and I, I think mm. that there is likely to be a bit of a philosoph philosophical if not a commercial fight over it uh, and i i think that we you know we we need people of goodwill to um uh, take over the new digital worlds uh, and 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 make them good mark you, were, you just reminded me when we were doing the pre the pre-call you talked about sort of you know what will win or or what will happen in this in this new space you've got the far east um kind of mindset which is um the sort of china variation on democracy or the china variation on things they've got a they've got a lifetime emperor right now um and they 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 um now are actually going and arresting people if they use a firewall to get to the real google um in their homes or you've got the far the that's the far east i'm sorry then you've got the far west which is silicon valley uh typified by Facebook, taking everyone's data and thinking they're, they're the only people who can do things for you. And you were saying, you know, could there be a third way? And I was really intrigued by that because I, I do wonder and worry about um, the two kinds of strong men I just described. And is there a third way? And is the EU or is, is the UK is, you know, is, is there some opportunity there to, to, to look for, um, a, a, a different approach that that could have a, a chance to see the light. Yeah, and I, and I very much hope so. And I think I think you describe it well there. Um, and I, I think this idea of data for the public good, uh, which is also um, about value creation. You know, it's it's not mm -hmm. it's not kind of it's not good capitalist or exactly. It's not it's not yeah. good in an airy fairy way. You know, it's recognizing that there needs to be value creation in, in order to deliver public good, but. Um, I think that that is something uh, that isn't the default setting uh, and therefore mm. um, it needs to be done on purpose. It needs energy put into it to make that happen because mm. I think the default settings um, are the other ones which don't end up so well. And yeah. in fact, if you look at the history of social media, when we began with, with blogging, there, it was open, there was RSS, uh, the, you know, things were interoperable. And pretty quickly we ended up in the silos of Facebook or Twitter, and uh, and we and we know how that goes, and so the, the, there's a clear sense that we, we know the pattern of these things. And since we're now dealing with actual governments and governance, the the question becomes: How do people collaborate and work together so that the stuff remains open? There's a broad set of stakeholders, and I think as you and I were talking on the pre-call, it'd be very easy for financial interests to kind of do the lion's share of the work you know a few large companies get the most contracts do most of the work with data and that that creates a smaller civic sphere that create and so probably requires new mechanisms uh that probably have the attractiveness the entertainment capacity or the the the, the attention getting capacity of games to bring it into the public sphere that essentially makes uh our, our civic square something that is participatory as we kind of go into this age of complexity yeah, yeah, I think I think there's really good points in there. I mean, I, just going back to that that thing that a few of us have said now about the collaborate on the rules, compete on the game. I think that if there's enough collaboration on the rules, and I'm not talking about kind of a a big state thing here. I'm just talking about you know, what are the minimum rules that we need to share in order to have a good game. Mm. Um, so so we set that up, but I think what what that then enables um, is a bigger, better game. You know, whichever game you think about is better because it's got rules, whether it's my version yeah. of football or your version of football um you, you need rules and everyone plays the same rules but actually you can get multitude of different games and all sorts of creativity happening in there and i i think that um what we need to be doing is is imagining the biggest best game we can um but that it can't be lawless you know it needs some rules and um you know, within that it seems to me that um that the kind of the bigger pie argument is is really important that if everyone goes and tries to grab their own little bit of the pie they'll find that mm. it is actually a smaller pie whereas if there's this collaboration on the rules the pie will be bigger and there'll be space for all of us yeah this is not a zero sum game potentially mickey we're back Mark, to thank you so much yeah Thank you so much for, for taking the time. And we want to let you go because I know it's late. And we really appreciate you you spending spending your evening with us. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Timony, any, any last words, Timony? Uh, no, I think I said everything earlier. So, but I appreciate, I, appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Timony, are you in, are you, what, what city are you in? San Francisco. You're up here. And when does Mars ship or when do people get their hands on it? Oh, last June. Last June. Oh, Got it. You can get and, it. And um, a final question. Are you seeing any um, Corpus Callosum, any connection between your gaming and entertainment world and your city digital twin enterprise world? Are the gamers the playing with the, huh? All yeah? the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah, there's, there's so many world building games out there right now and they become more and more realistic. Um, and are they yeah. using assets from cities? Like, uh, are, are you seeing world building games that are letting, you know, pulling in the physics of cities, of, of real cities and kind of back and forth? Yeah, exactly. Or, or, or basing new worlds based on real world information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what, give us an example or something to aim with that before we hang up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are there, are there titles or examples of things in the Unity platform that might we might not know about that would be examples of this that we could look at? Yeah. So um, unfortunately, I, I'm at time right now. So uh, All right. I'll have to we'll, we'll get that from you on a follow-up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Take care. Me. Uh, Mick, there are great connections here, as we can see, between the real world and the virtual world. And we've learned about both why these are a new form of language, and we can see the you know, we can see Mark out there really foraging in this kind of new space. And, and but I think it creates such an opportunity for intentional design uh, and, and you know, in this rebuilding moment. I agree. I mean, I, I suspect um, at the instantiation of a new medium, there's a lot of excitement. And I, th I feel like that excitement right now. I, I, I think a lot of people have not had the chance to be there in the homebrew computer club era. I'm sure you were kicking around somebody somewhere. Um, but uh, you know, you're not there uh, hanging out with Gutenberg with the new press and seeing how it wipes you know, across Europe and spreads and everything. And I think there's, there's something happening here and it's, it's, it's uncomfortable and it's interesting and it's exciting. Uh, and I actually think as we start democratizing or getting it out into more people's hands, we'll start to move from sort of the classic use of this technology, what we've seen so far, kind of trying to retrofit an old medium into a new medium. And we'll start to get to expressive use. And I think the expressiveness is where I'm pretty excited. Like how, what happens when we really start doing something expressive? Right, and this is, you know, we had, we, we talked to, uh, we, we had a couple of shows on this. Remember we talked to Claudia Hart, who had her one perspective on this. And on the same show, uh, well, who's the other artist we had on that? We, we, uh, uh, we've done two of these things with artists that look in different directions here. Uh, True enough. Okay. Well, listen, we're about to go, but it would not be complete if we didn't briefly throw it to Marshall McLuhan for the rap. Figured, yeah. We'll, go and for then, it. And then we'll be back. Let's see. Here's uh, – I'm clicking on – All media are extensions of some human faculty, mental or physical. The wheel is an extension of the foot. The book is an extension of the eye. Clothing is an extension of the skin. Electric circuitry is an extension of the central nervous system. The extension of any one sense displaces the other senses and alters the way we think, the way we see the world and ourselves. When these changes are made, men change. Well, I'm ready to there go. you go. Couldn't have said it. Oh, oh, here. And since we've been discussing construction and building the future, Mick. Really nice. Yeah. And are you, is that, are and you sure wearing either an episode of WKRP in Cincinnati or Beretta? For those of you that are old enough to remember either one of those, this is my sort of Huggy Bear meets David Byrne meets The Fall. Outfit. And of course, Mick, the reason we chose these is the dichotomy that this show is about, the natural world and the built world. Here you are bringing us the natural world that influences how we do generative design. And I'm, of course, representing the built world, what man creates. It's the union of these in systems thinking that defines quarantine. And I right am, I, today, I didn't even send Mickey. I sent my digital stunt double. That's exactly right. He was actually, both of you are on the show once. I, uh, I remember. Yeah. Okay, let's. What time is it? 
538 Pacific Quarantine. Have a wonderful Halloween. And we'll be back uh, next week in the future because our next show is going to be after the election or certainly into that period of entanglement that we call the post-election America. I'm looking forward to it. Omid, bring us out. Let's get close, but not so close. For time. You can share from a distance for a time. You know we want to see each other. We'll have to stay in your corner. Time space while we talk.